It's also, I think, very nice to have you back at the European handball. I've done that 2,000, 3,000 times, so uh, I'm not so worried about that. When I heard that Croatia were interested, I, I was willing to do anything to to join them. Who are the four hottest teams right now to maybe even go through to the semifinals? Ball across to Dylan Nahi, double in flight! Oh, what a start! Yeah, into the net. He does it again! Yes! And it is time to talk handball again for a little special episode because uh, I need to tell you about it that we are actually just recording on Monday, what is quite unusual for us uh, since the uh, first recording was scheduled on Friday. But this fella to my, uh, for you, it's the right hand side, wasn't able to join us. Victor Tomas, nice to see you. How's it going? Hello, guys. Very nice to be here, uh, to be back with you and excited for the, the guests that we're going to have today. Yeah, he is joining in the background already as well, so uh, we are going to introduce him in a little bit. But uh, at first I need to introduce the other host here as well, Mr. Beach Handball himself, Martin Wilstrup. How are you? Thank you, I'm good. Good to see you again also, and the same, good to have you back, Victor, with us again. It's always a pleasure, and I'm looking forward to... Uh, you know, getting some answers regarding Croatian and handball, uh, not only the national team, but also to see which direction the Croatian handball is, is going in, because we all know the history of Croatian handball. Uh, that's it. And the future of Croatian handball actually has a new face uh, because uh, they don't just have a new face. They have a new coach here as well. And we are very happy to introduce him as our guest, ladies and gentlemen. Dago Sigurdsson, nice that you are joining us and you are joining us in a new function. Congratulations on your new job at first. Thank you very much. Uh, Croatian handball national coach uh, that is your actually actually new position um, maybe you can describe us a little bit uh, how comes that you, you are in a new position how comes that you uh, are the Croatian national uh, coach right now well I, I, I've been there now I was uh, almost seven years in, in Japan and uh, the main reason I made a long contract with Japan was to qualify for the Olympic Games for uh, uh, Paris, but uh, then uh, I heard from the interest of, of Croatia and and uh, unfortunately it was not planned that I would jump ship, but uh, unfortunately the, they were in a situation where they are not qualified. So it was uh, crucial for them to get a coach in uh, as soon as possible. And uh, I was more than ready to do that. Of course, I had to negotiate that with Japan. It was uh, difficult to announce that uh, I would like to leave the post. So uh, it was a hurtful and, and painful uh, thing to do. But uh, I was uh, so convinced that uh, and I was so excited to 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 uh, get the Croatian team that uh, I was willing to to sacrifice the last six months uh, in Japan. So how actually were the talks between you and Japan and the Federation? Well, it's uh, always difficult because uh, you are uh, so far away. You are uh, on the other side of the of the world. So it took uh, quite a bit of time uh, to get answers. Uh, it's a different, different culture as well. And uh, I totally respect that. Uh, and I understand it took time, uh, everything that uh, was sent back and forth, we, uh, they had to translate and send it to the board members. And, and uh, so it was a long pro procedure, but uh, in the end, we are, we are parting on a very positive note. And uh, actually, uh, how did uh, the Croatians reach out to you? Um, and when did you get to know about the interest of the Croatians? Well, it was uh, actually I was, uh, of course, uh, at the Asian Championship, so I was back home in uh, Iceland. And uh, after the after the Euro, uh, I heard that uh, they had an interest. So 
we we tried to meet up. I went to went to Zagreb to to meet them and discuss and and I told them that I had to first uh, speak with the Japanese. So it was, uh, yeah, it was. Uh, I think they were excited to to get me, but I was even more excited to get the team. Mm -hmm. Hello, Dagur. It's uh, really nice Hi. to to have you here with us, and nice I think it's also very. It's also, I think, very nice to have you back at the European Handball. Uh, first of all, first to go to the new uh, position as a Croatian national team, uh, you had also an experience as a player in Japan, and now uh, you have been there for almost seven years. What would you say that you got from the Japanese Handball, which, which is so different from the European Handball? Yeah, it's really it's a really exciting uh, part of the world to coach handball because uh, they approach it uh, in a little bit different way. So it was it was uh, vital for me to have the experience as a player there, so uh, I could speed up the process in the beginning. Uh, of course, we were under pressure, time pressure when I took over because the Olympic Games in Tokyo were just uh, short short distance away. So we did everything we could to speed up the process. Uh, I knew that uh, to make a really difference, uh, I, I had to be there long term, six to seven years. And uh, uh, that made the, it possible to cho uh, choose very young players in the beginning. So we were taking 17, 18 year old players in the beginning and, and giving them for four or five years to get the experience to play against foreign players and to play with the national team. And this uh, Japanese league is far away from, from Europe, but they have really talented players, but they lack uh, experience. So our main focus was to give them so many uh, as many games as possible. And uh, in the end, it paid off. Um, we we had a great finish in the, in the Olympic qualification and then uh, only losing in the final against Qatar in the, the Asian Championship. So I'm really, really mm. pleased and also honored to uh, proud of the team and proud of my time in, in Japan. What would you say is the potential of that national team? Because actually it's a kind of handball that I love to see because maybe I relate to them because I'm a similar size of, of the players of, uh, of Japan. <laughs> and uh, what would you say it's their potential playing against the European uh, teams? They have huge potential, but it's also very fragile. They don't have mm -hmm. that big of a pool of players. And uh, it can go both ways. Uh, the competition in Asia is getting stronger. The Middle East countries are are getting stronger. There are European coaches all over the place. So those countries are developing quite quickly. Uh, we managed to overtake Korea, who are only always the the big rival. Uh, and when those countries come up with good teams and good generations like Japan have now, they are uh, well in, in uh, reach of the European teams. I was really looking forward to playing again with, uh, mm -hmm. with this team against the European teams uh, at, the, mm -hmm. at the Olympics uh, to really show the world uh, how far they come. But unfortunately, I, I will not be in that position. I was, uh, hey Dark, well, first of all, nice to have you here and appreciate that you took the time. Thank you. I actually want to know, um, do you speak any, did you learn the language a little bit or because it's a little bit different from what you used to probably? <laughs> yeah, actually, actually, I learned uh, quite a lot Japanese, but it's, it's difficult. Yes, uh, I managed to coach, uh, coach the team mostly in Japanese. But for team uh, meetings and the press conferences, I, I used English. And then uh, my, my right hand man, uh, Mr. Manabu, with me, and he translated quite, very quickly. I have more concerns about the Croatian. I, I, it, uh, it's, <laughs> it looks very difficult for me. 
And maybe that's a, a good spot to switch it over to your employment in Croatia right now. Uh, because you just said that uh, once you arrived in Japan, you uh, actually just gave a lot of young players the chance to uh, yeah, run up for the national team. Uh, what are your plans for the Croatian national team? Are you going to change a lot from what we saw from the Croats uh, at, the, at the Euro? Yeah, I, I think, you know, before I start to uh, look at the future for, for Croatian handball, uh, we are just looking at the next two weeks. And uh, I, I think the team will, will uh, play and look uh, very similar to what they did then. Uh, unfortunately, we have some key players injured or, or getting back from injury that will not be fit for, for those games. So, uh, uh, I must make changes there, and I think uh, I think that will be changes enough for this short period. Uh, I will only get uh, two three game uh, two three days with the team before the first match, so you should not expect a lot of changes. How are you going to approach the players in those two or three days? Well, at the end of the day, you know, you just go into the sports hall and you start the handball training and. Uh, I've done that 2,000, 3,000 times, so uh, I'm not so worried about that. You know, it's it's not about uh, any chit chat or or uh, great meetings. It's just gonna be going in the hall and and start the training. And how how do you face this challenge in your career? Because you already had uh, experience in Austria and also in Germany as a national team coach which I have uh, really bad memories of you being a coach of uh, <laughs> Germany. Uh, how do you face this challenge in such a big humble country as Croatia? Because they also have a very special environment. You know, it's always been Croatian coaches uh, uh, and the, the players, as you will know, they have big characters and you will have big characters in your team. How are you facing this challenge? I think, you know, with just with common sense, uh, <clears throat> I think a lot of things are similar to uh, to the situation when I took over the German national team. Uh, a little bit the glory days from uh, from before are over. Uh, the golden generation is coming to an end and somebody must take over. And uh, they had now a couple of year, difficult years is very similar like Germany had after after the success of Heine Brandt in in uh, Germany 2007 yeah so uh, it's now the time to to uh, release this potential that this teams have and and uh, release them from from the pressure from before uh, we know that the team is good but so are also a lot of teams uh, we can see it just at the euros that uh, that uh, even Spain did not do that well this this year. So it's really really a big competition, especially between th number four until number 12, 13, 14. So there's no guarantees that you have a success uh, immediately. What uh, what is exciting for for this team is uh, of course this qualification. Uh, and then uh, the world championship in in croatia uh, in january so i think that is the most exciting thing that a, a player can have and it will be my job to to uh, find the right mixture of players and and find the right system to play and and help them in uh, any way um victor kind of uh, said it a little bit i was uh, sitting here and waiting to ask it also but do you feel a little bit of extra pressure in terms of when it comes to being first foreign coach you know being in charge of the Croatian national team because obviously we know the history of the national team and also that you know it's a team that a lot of people are following and they're to me it seems like they're very proud of the national team of course all nations are but the, the mentality of that Victor also spoke about. Do you feel an extra pressure when it comes to, you know, coming from outside and then being in charge of, of, of the national team now? Well, I've, I've definitely felt uh, the excitement and the knowledge that people on the street have here on the national team. Everybody following their national teams, it's football, basketball, handball. 
they are just uh, they are sport crazy nation and uh, yes. i think it's uh, maybe less pressure for me than to have a croatian coach um, i can always go back to iceland and relax uh, and, <laughs> and uh, get out of the out of the way but uh, you know uh, of course there's pressure on the on the team of pro pressure on the coach but uh, I'm also in a good position that I that I have uh, experience from from other national teams, from club teams. So uh, I'm pretty pretty confident that we will we will uh, develop the team, and uh, of course everybody must must uh, sacrifice and and uh, also uh, also uh, think in a, in a very team minded way. So it will be a hard work. Uh, there, are, there are a lot of obstacles coming, but uh, I'm positive in the beginning and, and now just focusing on the next two weeks. Only for curiosity, uh, the staff that you are going to be working in Croatia, uh, do, you will have a mixture of Icelandic staff and Croatian or it's going to be you and all Croatians or how are you going to manage that? Yeah, usually I have always worked with, uh, with the local staff. And uh, this time, because I have a very short notice, I will uh, take one uh, Gunnar Magnusson. Uh, he was working with the Gudmundsson and Gislason uh, with the national team. He went to, I don't know, three Olympics, two Olympic qualifications, seven, eight world championship, European championship. Yeah. He will be helping me with uh, the analyzing uh, just in the background. But uh, other than that, we have very similar stuff uh, Dennis Poljaric, who was my defense uh, uh, chef in uh, Berlin, he will mm -hmm. be my assistant coach. Very, very trustworthy guy, calm and uh, has a good, cool head. Nice, nice. I think it's important I because wanted... they, they know each other, you know, they know each other and how to, you know, sometimes uh, the characters inside the team, and I think it's going to be very useful for for you to have him there. Definitely. I, I wanted to hear. Uh, was it also a little bit of an eager for you to come back to European handball? Because we all know that handball in Europe is a very very big sport, and compared to Asia, with all the respect, um, uh, there are different sports that has more interest than handball over there. Although it's going in the right direction, was it also a little bit? Of, of you, you know, going back to Europe and, you know, trying a new culture uh, because you've been in Austria, Germany and Japan and now Croatia. It was not a ego thing, but uh, I was looking for passion. And uh, yeah. even even uh, the Icelandic national team, that was something interesting for me. Uh, but unfortunately, that didn't happen. Um, but I was looking for something that would uh, have passion. Um, after after being in Japan for such a long time, it's different. It's different kind of uh, mentality in Japan. It's very polite. Yeah. Uh, you don't have this this uh, passion for the sports like we have here in Europe. And Croatia is the the top of the pile in in passion. Uh, <laughs> and Immediately, I, I had also interest from from other national teams, both in in Asia and and Europe, and also club teams. But immediately, when 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 I heard that Croatia were interested, I I was willing to do anything to to join them. What is actually something that you would still like to achieve in your career? Uh, I would say one of your uh, biggest achievements uh, was uh, in the Euro final 2016. Uh, you actually already uh, talked about it, Victor. Uh, what is there left on your bucket list? I don't have bucket list. I never had bucket list. Uh, I choose my my jobs from uh, from just the feeling of it. You know, I. I if, if the feeling is right, I, 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 I take the step and it was always like that. Uh, I think, you know, the European Championship definitely was, was up there. The, the bronze medal in, in Rio was also up there. And the qualification with Japan was also up there because it took six, seven years 
and you had to uh, be on the point just one weekend to to make it happen so it was also huge for me uh, to to manage to do that with japan after uh, such a long time and so many trainings and uh, they are it's, it's a little bit different than than in europe you know you have more time to to train and coach and in in uh, europe it's more like a management where you have to put together the team and and select the the system um yeah go ahead victor yeah uh you you said it a little bit in your uh, previous answer uh that you had some interest from some clubs uh so after you left berlin uh you took the german national team now japan and now croatia um do you have in mind in the future to to be a coach of a of a team of a club or you rather uh, no stay actually actually national. i don't have any plans after after croatia i'm, I'm just gonna concentrate on this and uh, hopefully uh, i will enjoy the uh, stay here in croatia hopefully they will be happy with my my job and uh, if not then we we part ways but uh, i i'm really uh, just thinking about doing this job now for uh, as good as i can and after that nobody knows but to be to be a a, a club coach it's something that you don't uh, discard in your career so everything can no, happen no, no. I, I right? mean it could it could still happen it could could okay. still happen it depending on uh, on uh, my situation also how my family is and and uh, and so on um, so at the moment uh, it could happen but uh, now it's just the focusing on on the next couple of years here but i mean uh, if we're looking at your previous stations then we see that you've been a national coach for 10 consecutive years now um what's the specialty about coaching a national team well it's different it's different the the austria and the german national teams uh, compared to japan you cannot compare uh, the asian the Asians uh, have a different calendar. They have more time to to, to train. Uh, in Europe, it's it's uh, short periods, and uh, you're uh, always under the pressure. Always, the next game is is a qualification one or uh, at the big tournament. So, uh, and the the bad thing about it, if you if you do badly, it takes one year to correct it. So, uh, it's better to win. <laughs> yeah, uh, it it always yeah, is. I was and uh, go ahead, Martin. Yeah, I was more like thinking about you said it yourself because we know what you you've been doing in terms of winning gold at the European Championship, the bronze medal, also if, if I remember correctly, the cup with Fischer Berlin. Um, but um, if I look at it, um, there are some top teams at the moment in terms of national teams. I see Denmark, France, and also Sweden. They've been up there. We usually also see Spain. Um, what are the dreams and hopes for Croatia? Because normally we will also speak about Croatia when in terms of you know semifinals, at big championships, qualifications. Uh, are the dreams and hopes for Croatia to be back? You know, at the can you can I say the biggest stage? Because obviously they are there, but in, it's been looking like. The teams that I just mentioned have a little bit more quality in terms of the squad or maybe experience at the biggest uh, competitions. Yeah, definitely. I think, you know, the the table from last five, six years, it doesn't lie. You know, we see those teams uh, up there and they are definitely the strongest at the moment. Uh, but like I said before, you know, the, the competition from maybe, you know, from fourth place to, to 12 or 13 or 14, is huge and you have teams there norway iceland hungary yeah. and uh, even now spain uh, must fight their way back up you know it's it's really hard competition first of all you have to stabilize uh, stabilize yourself there and then you you can at uh, some point maybe attack the the big three yeah because i think it's also you, 
Yeah, yeah, top four. Because I think it's interesting also because this season we also on the club team we've seen Saka been doing really well in the Machine Chiri EHF Champions League. You know, they already qualified, they beat it to Paris Saint Germain in the last week. I also think that's very important for Croatian handball in general, you know, to have club teams where younger players can perform and not only perform in, you know, clubs outside Croatia, but also have a top club yeah. top club team in Croatia that deliver on the biggest stage in terms of club. So that I, I think that's yeah, also definitely. Yeah. It's definitely, definitely, you know, if you if you want to develop the the handball, it, it's not enough to develop the national team alone. We, I spoke so many times about this in Germany and also in Japan, that the the league and the national team must go parallel, and you must push both yeah. things to to uh, take the next step. And uh, I think uh, Nexe and Zagreb are doing very very well in in yeah. uh, in terms of. Uh, Using young players and pushing the pushing the the teams, uh, so uh, I think this will uh, help and uh, the national team will benefit from it. I I really would like to know Dagur uh, now uh, as a national team coach. Uh, I'm sure that you have been in touch or watching a lot of handball, but a Croatian handball. Uh, I don't know how into that uh, market uh, you were looking at in the last five, six, seven years uh, where you have been uh, working in Japan. Uh, can you explain us a little bit how is your everyday job? How, how many handball games do you watch a day or a week? Uh, how you control the, 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 the players, the prospects that in the Croatian market? Well, I, I you know, I'm just starting here, so it's a little bit difficult, but uh, Usually, the the preparation. Of course, I I have to analyze the Croatian team themselves first here. Uh, this is what you do in the beginning to analyze the the group of players you have already, and uh, then in the uh, for example now for the qualification, I start to go into the our opponent, and uh, sometimes I watch a lot, sometimes I not so much. Uh, sometimes it's just the uh, a matter of thinking about uh, how you're gonna find the right balance for the team and uh, which players can can help you in, in what situation. Uh, after that, uh, after the qualification, we can we can uh, take our time to uh, make a more long uh, strategic uh, plan for for the national team and and I definitely want to look more at the at the younger players and also the the league players who are who could. Uh, at some point uh, help us in the future mm -hmm. um maybe to slowly but steadily come to an end here uh, we have two former opponents uh, sitting in this call right now um because uh, you coached the german national team to the success um and actually the first match uh, of that very competition was against spain was against victor tomas spain um <laughs> and you guys uh, lost it so uh, germany lost the the first uh, the first match uh, the, it was the opening match for you guys um and then in the final you guys met again how did you prepare the team for the final well it was uh, it was uh, of course very strange uh, competition for germany we we came with a very young team and a lot of players injured i think uh, vincek was injured uh, gensheimer was injured grotsky was injured drux was injured a lot of injuries uh, before the tournament and in the tournament we also lost Dissinger, uh, Stefan Weinhold and uh, we got players in from uh, from Germany in the middle of the tournament and this was also the tournament that uh, that Andy Wolf uh, didn't start the tournament but uh, he uh, he was made in this tournament and uh, the final game of course was was his I think uh, Thomas should not have a nightmares about me but maybe uh, maybe <laughs> because of Andy Wolf. Uh, <laughs> a little bit both a little bit both of you guys <laughs> a little bit both yeah okay. how did you prepare your team for victor tomas there actually oh my god no it was it was a very simple uh, you know when you when you <laughs> already played I, I don't know seven eight games <laughs> there is not so much to say uh, even if you're going into final it was not so it was not so complicated. We decided to be very defensive. I remember, uh, not go out so much. Uh, I think the 
uh, we wanted to close the pivots. Um, uh, I, I I don't remember, but you know it was a very simple <laughs> game plan, like it is somehow in at the end of the tournament when the players are already tired and you must keep it simple. Yeah, fair uh, enough. You, you know you know how important are the dynamics uh, and the momentum in handball. I really felt yeah. that championship that Germany at some point. I th I'm not sure if it was against Sweden. I don't remember correctly. I think, but I, I think that everybody could feel a little bit in the in the atmosphere that it was the momentum of of Germany. Yeah. And as you said, Dagur, the explosion of Andy Wolf in that championship, and especially yeah. in that final, it was yeah. just uh, unbeatable. Yeah. Um, absolutely, uh, absolutely. Uh, maybe to to keep it at the the analysis of Spain. Victor always says about himself uh, that he was a very underused right back. Would you agree on that statement? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe in this game he could have helped. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you for that. Thank you for that. I'm sure I could have. <laughs> Uh, fair enough. Uh, cool. Uh, yeah. Then, uh, Dagur, I would say uh, thank you. Thanks a lot for, for joining us, for taking the time. Um, and very much luck. And uh, yeah, uh, that all your hopes and dreams will come true with the Croatian national team. Good luck for the upcoming thank you test very much. for you. Thank you. Good luck. Thank you. Good luck, Dagur. Thank, thank you for being with us. Nice yeah. to see you guys. Thank you. Victor, unfortunately, wasn't able to make it to our regular podcast recording on Friday. That's why we had to schedule this appointment with Dago Sigurdsson just on Monday. But Martin and me, we already analyzed the situation of the Machine Seeker EHF Champions League. It couldn't get more intense than this. And what's in it for all the clubs, you will hear it throughout the next 20 minutes. So enjoy. Let's not waste too much time today uh, talking about everything else because uh, it has been one hell of a ride in the Machine Seeker EHF Champions League this uh, this week. Um, we did see an intense match of the week and uh, things changed for the last match day. So how much tempo were you able to follow actively this week? Well, obviously I watched uh, GeoG play against Wisla Plotz. I also watched Barcelona against Magdeburg and then I was uh, able to also watch some minutes of some of the other games, but uh, in general, just looking at the statistics and also um, the results, of course. Um, so a couple of games I was able to, but two full games, and then the rest of it was, you know, within half an eye, and then yeah. watching some of some of the one game and then switching over to another one, depending on, you know, if it was a close one or not. So, uh, yeah, it's looking interesting. It, it's always nice, to, you know, to have these matches at the end of the group stage where, you know, it can be decisive who's going to take the first two spots, who's going to go through to the next round, to the knockout phase. And also speaking about who's going to become from number three to number six, because that's also have to something to say, who you're going to match up with in potential um, last 16s. Yeah, absolutely. And we're at that point right now where the calculations start. So where everyone's looking yeah. at, oh, well, <laughs> if we win here and they lose and if there's a draw here, uh, how's the constellation for the, um, yeah, for the, for the uh, playoffs and the potential quarterfinals there as well? Because we do have, I think it's uh, three fixed quarterfinal participants right now. So uh, we have uh, TRV. They've been uh, secure for quite some time now. We uh, do have Barca and we do have Arborg uh, who are already qualified. And the last spot is in between Magdeburg and Vesprem. Magdeburg on 22 <laughs> points after uh, this round um, and Vesprem uh, on 20 points after uh, round number 13. Um, and we will be looking forward to the direct encounter uh, of the the two giants that are willing to go straight through to the uh, to the quarterfinals. Who's your favorite? Well, I have to stick with the with the Vesprem uh, prediction because they, you know they're playing in Hungary. Although Magdeburg they won uh, yesterday uh, when we're recording, uh, Magdeburg plays at home against Barcelona yesterday and won with one goal with the last minute uh, second goal of Gisler Christensen. But Vesprem is my favorite been throughout the season, and I expect them also to take uh, one of the one of the spots uh, for the quarterfinals. Although, and if I remember correctly, Vesprem also won whenever they played in Germany in the beginning of the season. So, uh, you know, playing in Hungary, I have to stick with uh, Vesprem, but uh, Magdeburg, they're definitely a tough one. So it's going to be a close game. Um, 
we saw that yesterday also when they won. So, uh, but West Ham is my favorite, and I expect them to take it also um, and secure the spot for the quarterfinal. Yeah, I uh, don't agree there actually. So uh, if uh, I was to <laughs> predict right now, uh, I am gonna go with Magdeburg there. So uh, my hot take of the week will be that Magdeburg has taken the the last quarterfinal spot here, but still we are gonna see uh, Vesprem in the in the quarterfinals, and then uh, it will be super intense to see who lands where and uh, who will be the opponent. But uh, from yesterday, we uh, actually learned that Magdeburg is a complete different team than what we saw at the beginning of the season so uh, Magdeburg in the match of the week yeah. against uh, Barca they were actually down by four goals at some point in the first half yeah. um, but still managed to turn it around uh, on one hand side because Sergei Hernandez had a quite decent game it wasn't an outstanding game from uh, the, the Magdeburg goalies uh, but especially in the first half he was the uh, yeah keeping his percentage above the 30%, um, but you're still just the third best goalkeeper in the ter in this game when you're uh, just slightly above 30% in the first half, because on one hand side, Emil Nielsen finished the first half on 41%, um, and after the the break, uh, it, it was Gonzalo Perez de Vargas <laughs> who actually came in and saved three out of three penalties, but still Man. Barca didn't win. <laughs> Yeah, it's insane. You know, we spoke about it also earlier that, you know, Barcelona won actually the goalkeeper battle with, I don't know how many saves, eight, nine or something like that. And then Magdeburg managed still to win. You know, it has to do something within the quality of the Barcelona players. Maybe they didn't hit the goal. Maybe they had too many technical mistakes or just in general that the Magdeburg defense did really well. But I always find it impressive by uh, by Magdeburg because they have Janusz Marf and they have Felix Kla and Oma Ingi. And to yep. me, you know, they're not players that will shoot from 11, 12 meters, but they are so unbelievable great at one versus one and putting speed into the game and also the passing speed that they have that, you know, they're just super dangerous. Um, but um, quickly remind also about the, you know, hot takes of the week. I also predicted Zagreb to win against Paris Saint-Germain and uh, that one actually made it through. So uh, first one uh, for me, actually great to be uh, back on track Uh Haven't been looking too much into the, but you mentioned that Magdeburg would take the win against the uh, Vespam. That's a that's a nice hot take actually. To uh, I was hoping for that Olborg versus Kelsch also in the last round. There was more to play for, maybe the second spot in the group as well. But uh, obviously, there's a lot to play for for Kelsch. But uh, that would be a nice game also to to have a look at. Um, um, but yeah. Zagreb have a lot to play for and they go into Kiel and Kiel, you know, they already qualified. I don't know if they're going to arrest any players. So that will also be interesting to have a look at because if I look at Zagreb, they won against Paris Saint-Germain and then they beat it Kolstad with, was it eight or nine goals away? Yeah, I don't remember yeah, yeah. how many Somewhere goals, but it, it was a lot of goals, you know. So um, so um, they're on the run. So that's going to be interesting to to have a look at. Yeah, uh, I mean, we can uh, have a look at the, the upcoming matches in a second there. I uh, did want to keep it at uh, Magdeburg-Barca for another uh, minute or so, uh, yeah. because it was the complete comeback of Gisli Christiansen in the Machine Secret Age of Champions League there. Um, and just how intense he came back. Um, he seems to like playing against Barca. So uh, we all remember <laughs> that semifinal from last year. Um, but then uh, Gisli Christiansen... He didn't just uh, go into that game to score six out of six, but he went for that buzzer beater as well. Um, and yeah. it's just uh, incredible how one person just makes the whole squad better just from being there. Um, and Gisli Christiansen, he seems to be a potential X factor uh, for Magdeburg and a reason why they will aim high this uh, this year again. Yeah, he was unbelievable yesterday. And, you know, the speed... He can bring whenever he's going one versus one and he's so fast, you know, it's it's hard to keep up with him. And uh, yeah, he may make the buzzer beater and also celebrate it. Uh, that was an important one for them. But I think with the time, we will also see whenever he gets, a, you know, more playing time and get more fit, then probably he's also going to be expected to be starting. And then we will see Janos Marsan probably be the one, you know, coming in from the bench. But um, yeah, there's definitely one to bring in. Uh, and yesterday was important that he came in and delivered as he did because I think Felix Klar, he missed 
seven, eight, eight shots, uh, Omaingi, a couple of shots as well, also some of penalties. But, you know, then him coming in and having a 100% at a crucial time, you know, uh, yeah, definitely means a lot. And now they are... You know, we also have to have in mind that whenever they go into Hungary, they can settle for a draw. And obviously, you know, you cannot play for a draw whenever in a handball yeah. match. But it's it's so, still something you have to have in the back of your mind whenever you probably, if you have the ball and there's 10 seconds left, you don't yeah. have to go for the win. But uh, his performance yesterday, uh, yeah, come back. Uh, you know, made the bus a beat uh, 100%, you know, and uh, yeah, unbelievable performance. And uh, we've seen it before, but if that's the level he's coming back with, then uh, that's a lot to expect. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, uh, especially now that you're uh, bringing up the, the, uh, the upcoming match, Of course, uh, Magdeburg won't play for a draw, but uh, that will get interesting once there's uh, like two minutes left to play, and uh, then we have to have a look at the scoreline. Whether it's uh, yeah, yeah, a two two goal lead for Magdeburg there, and then they can start managing the clock or something like that. But that is uh, yeah. just written in the stars, and uh, we will see it next week. And next week we will see where PSG is ending there uh, in the group stage as well, because right now it doesn't even look bad for them so in group a they are still on the third spot but if things fail them horribly then they might yeah. even drop to the sixth <laughs> spot because uh, it is yeah, uh, yeah psg on, on third spot with 15 points and uh, pick second they're actually uh, on the sixth spot with 13 points so it is just two uh, points in between them but PSG is facing Seged. So uh, in the very first yeah. encounter, uh, in the, on the very first match day, they actually already played against each other. It was uh, PSG plus two, so they won uh, 31 to 29. If Seged manages to uh, beat them by three, somehow they hold the direct encounter and will go past uh, PSG. And then we have to see what happens in the other matches. Uh, but yeah, there's uh, just too much possible to happen there um but how is it possible for for paris to, yeah. to actually lose against zagreb that's it's it's insane mm, yeah i would say it would be a huge surprise if paris in in france don't you know secure the win and the first part in the group but on the other hand i would just say that it's unbelievable us speaking here in the last round of the group that we are actually able of you know that there are four teams all of them are secured to the to the knockout stage but all of them could end at sixth or fifth, fourth or third place. You know, that's interesting uh, because um, Seged against Paris, you know, you have Kelsche, Olborg, and then you have Kiel against the Zagreb also. So uh, mm -hmm. there's a lot to keep an eye on. And um, if I had to predict, I would say that Paris is going to win. But let's say that Kelsche are not going to Olborg and will, won't win there. Then you have them probably ending on the fifth place if Zagreb can secure the win in, in Kiel. And then, you know, Montpellier, Uh, they are facing Sakeb on one hand, and then the next minute they will face Kelsche. And they are actually number four in, in their group. So normally you would get what you would call an easy opponent, uh, if you can call it like that, because obviously there are no easy ones. But facing Kelsche, when you're becoming fourth in the group with Wisbam, Magdeburg and Barcelona, <laughs> I would say that's a, that's a tough matchup for them. Um, but uh, let's see, there's a lot to play for. I predict uh, Paris to take the third spot. Yeah, so uh, if we're looking at the further uh, tournament, then uh, you would definitely want to avoid the sixth spot in Group A because then you will encounter uh, the third of Group B. And yeah. in my opinion, the uh, top three of Group B uh, are the three hottest teams in the Machine Secret HF Champions League right now. So uh, maybe uh, let's do it right here. Yeah. Uh, maybe let's do a hot ranking for from the top four. So uh, who are the four hottest teams right now to maybe even go through to the semifinals? Um, maybe to kick it off here, I'm going to give you my number four uh, because even though they lead the group, THV Kiel is only my uh, number four in the hot ranking. Yeah. Oh, I was thinking about saying them as well. Um, I have to go with you and saying Kiel as well, because although, although they are now secured the quarterfinal spot and they're leading the Danish league, they lost the cup final against GOG and uh, having won a title in, in Denmark the last year. And I know their coach is going to stop by the end of the season also. So uh, Kiel, I think, Kiel, I agree with you on the, on the fourth spot here. I think it's their the top three that you and me probably are going to disagree a little bit about. But 
<laughs> yeah, <laughs> see, probably, we'll probably. Um, <laughs> we'll see. But uh, uh, everything open there uh, in between the first two. Um, and on the other hand, uh, my number three. At this point of the tournament, I think the table doesn't lie anymore. And uh, as we are right now, um, Telecom Vesprem, they already lost three times in the Machine Secret HF Champions League. Um, and yeah, if you have more losses after uh, 13 games, you can't surpass the top two. So Vesprem actually only my number three in the hot ranking. Yeah, I go with Magdeburg as my number three because uh, Vesprem beat it, uh, Magdeburg. Uh, and uh, I, I see the point of having three losses there. One of them against Barcelona also, uh, GOG. And then I um, was the last lost. I don't actually remember at the moment. But um, yeah, I, I go with Magdeburg as number three. Um, and then uh, number two and one, I have my doubts. But uh yeah, I have to go. If I have to say my number two first, I probably have to say Vespam because in order for them to make it on the top, then they have to show it against Magdeburg the next uh, the next upcoming match. And uh, yeah, I will say Vespam at number two, and then uh, yeah. Yeah, my problem with Vesprem is uh, that they haven't been consistent enough. That uh, once they were needed, they uh, actually lost their games. Um, and that was just uh, super surprising there. So uh, if we actually have a look at what happened before yeah. the, the Euro break there, um, they lost their uh, crucial match against uh, Wisla Plotsk, and that's why they are not True. in the position right now to actually be talking about the direct uh, quarterfinals spot because uh, it is Magdeburg being in the pole position um, and that's why Magdeburg actually uh, comes down to my number two in the hot ranking right but here. Um, I have to say something to my defense about taking Vespam as number two. Um, Vespam already beat it Magdeburg once, they beat it Barcelona once and lost once against Barcelona. So playing against number one and two in the group, won two out of three matches. Uh, on the other hand, yeah, so they made some stupid losses against GOG and Wiesle Plotsch. Um, which the other team didn't do, but they showed that they, whenever they, you know, perform at the highest level, they're capable of beating every team there is. But uh, yeah, it's interesting. We, you and me will be much uh, cleverer when, uh, whenever they played against each other in the next week. Uh, but um, it's fair. To, I think it's fair, no matter who you take uh, for the hot ranking here. But at least we agree on that at the moment. Although they lost yesterday against Magdeburg, that Barcelona are probably. Um, number one on the on the on the hot ranking power ranking yeah barca has to be the number one right now um because they just show that in the depth of the squad and in the strength of the team uh, nobody can surpass them um but the one reason why they are unbeatable for me uh, when it comes down to the first spot is the goalkeepers because we've seen it just yesterday um yeah. when uh, yeah they faced magdeburg that you do have a world-class Emil Nielsen in goal and uh, you still sub him off for penalties and then Paris de Vargas comes in <laughs> and saves the day for Barca. So uh, he saves three out of three penalties there. I uh, won't get tired of highlighting that. Um, but yeah, still he uh, was what? staying in goal and uh, for the for the rest of the match, still at around 30%. But Emil Nielsen ended the game on 36%. I mean, that's still not his average from the first half where he ended up at 41%. But still, you have to ask whether that was the right choice. Yeah, true. Uh, like I would say, 36 is, is, is pretty acceptable and decent for a goalkeeper. Um, but what amazed me the most is before the season, we were speaking about, you know, the injury of uh, Domen Magic and also... Um, Dale, uh, Lucas Senderich left the club mm. and also Fabregas uh, left the club and, you know, them bringing in what I would assume is two more unknown line players, you know, from Spain and who will take over for the playmaker position with Sinti Gamen places. So also having that in mind, I find it's pretty unbelievable with Barcelona uh, that they are in the position that they are at the moment because they lost. To me, the world's best line player, Lucas Sindrich, also an amazing player, had another injury, but they're still performing and managing, managing their way around it. Uh, yep. So, um, 
uh, yeah, that's impressive. And uh, Barcelona will definitely be there also with the experience they have with the coach and also with the squad. So uh, that's going to be interesting to see. And also the matchups coming up, you know, it's uh, it's not over yet. Although that uh, the only, you know, spot not secured yet is the Wisla Plotch against Porto, in the, which will be played in Poland. And the winner will take, you know, the last spot uh, in the knockout stage. Um, Wisla are probably the favorites for it and they're playing in Poland. So, uh, but let's see, it's going to probably be a tight game. I do think so too. So uh, that's the next direct encounter that we're looking at next week. So uh, the first match was being played in Plotsk. Porto actually took that with the 24 to 23. And uh, now they are actually fighting for the very, very last spot of the playoffs. So uh, everything else is uh, almost decided already. But yeah. uh, when it comes down to... Porto won the first season. one in Portugal, right? Um, it was in in Plotsk, but uh, Porto won it. Uh, so or no, uh, I think they're going to play in in Plotsk this uh, upcoming round. Um, ah, okay, okay, okay. I think sorry, uh, yeah. that uh, Porto won it with one. But yeah, no matter what, it was a close game, and uh, yeah. it would definitely, as you said, be a close one also when they're playing against. And to me, surprising that Plotsk actually got a draw away against Gilgi because Gilgi was leading with five or six goals. And uh, uh, Finn, can you say it in some way, probably is the wrong word for it, but a little bit stupid of Gilgi not to secure the win whenever they had the chance because they're also fighting for the spot, for the first, fourth spot in that group, you know, with Montpellier. They only have one point up up to Montpellier and they're playing against Celia, so I expect them to win that one. But as you said, it has something to do with who are you going to face from the other group. Uh, and uh, at the moment, that can be everyone. But no matter what, you will still assume that the higher you get in the group, the easier uh, the opponent will get in the knockout stage. Absolutely. Um, and in the end, it uh, won't really matter too much because uh, I'm actually uh, saying goodbye to my uh, to my Kielce take. So uh, I am actually saying goodbye Ooh. to Kielce in the semifinals. I'm stepping back here because uh, my four oh. semifinalists will definitely be um, Barca. We will see Vesprem. We will see Magdeburg and we will see THV Kiel. So uh, the top four teams right now, they will keep their level and they are going to go through to the semifinals. That hurts your heart, doesn't it? It does. You know, but it, it does. takes a man to admit it whenever, you know, he's, <laughs> I wouldn't say wrong, but changing his mind. Uh, but that also leaves you left with, you know, I think Dushabayev MVP and not being at the Final Four event. I think that's that going to be happen. a tough one. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but still, but I see, mean... Uh, see, you know... They still got the chance and they got the experience. And if Wolf is keeping up with the level that we saw from the European Championship, then uh, that will be a talk we will have. But uh, I also thought about when you said your power ranking that you don't have uh, the, your predictions in the top four. But uh, yeah, um, I, I actually agree with you. But uh, let's see if we are right or wrong. And uh I'm looking forward to another, you know, a bunch of great games and also this decisive one with the uh, Vista Plots Porto and also all the other teams that we already spoke about. They have a lot to play for in the groups with the, with whatever place they're gonna, you know, end up in the group. And uh, yeah, to whether to see if it's Magdeburg or Westfram who's gonna take the the quarterfinal spot. That will be. Uh, I, I, I think we went for a treat yesterday, as you said, Barcelona leading against Magdeburg. But I think Westfram and Magdeburg is also gonna be one hell of a game. And yeah, uh, yeah. it's just about to go out, pop some popcorn, and uh, <laughs> you know, feel comfortable in the couch, and then uh, you're in for a treat. Absolutely. And I mean, the, the weeks are getting hot. The stages of the Machine Seeker EHF Champions League are getting way more intense than uh, yeah at the beginning of the season. Uh, every match will be a knockout match from now on. So uh, every match will be uh, super important. Um, once that we're in the playoffs, uh, the, the first and second leg, they will decide on who is uh, going to join uh, Barca potentially Magdeburg or Vesprem, Alborg and Kiel in the in the quarterfinals. Uh, but I would say the answer, as always, it lays on the court. And uh, since uh, we are looking forward to next week, I'd say let's keep the episode short today. And uh, we have spoken about the most important stuff in the Machine Seeker EHF Champions League. And uh, that is where the focus is on. And uh, Martin, any closing words from you? 
No, I think it was actually really nice to do a power ranking here quickly. And, you know, as I said, uh, the next week, uh, the one of us will, uh, you know, be, uh, be clever whenever it comes to Magdeburg West Prem. But uh, I'm definitely looking forward to that one. And, uh, you know, um, closing words would be that uh, I know that Victor was a bad loser, but I didn't know that he wouldn't show up, although I just got <laughs> one point in Who Am I? And uh, I'm looking forward to another, uh, you know, a great... Uh, can you say challenge episode of the Who Am I? Because I think that's a great game. And uh, yeah, Victor have to do his homework. He saw it himself, you know. But uh, yeah, I think it's nice, you know, to catch up quickly with the stuff. And uh, then we will be back with a, a great guest and a longer episode. So uh, yeah, I'll, we could do a teaser. But as you already know from your experience, we will always have great guests. And the one that we are <laughs> planning on, he, is, uh, he's, he played the European Championship. And that's about it, we can say. That's the way. And uh, with that, we'll leave you uh, for a great week of handball. So uh, make yourself comfortable. As Martin said, go grab yourself some pop popcorn. And uh, next week, we will hear each other again when it's time to talk handball again. Ball across to Dylan Nahi. Double in flight. Oh, what a start. Ooh, yeah. Into the net. She does it again. Yeah.